Hi, my name is Shaji Kumar. I'm a hematologist at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, I will be talking about some of the recent updates to management of patients with multiple myeloma. The summer disclosures. As you know, the myeloma treatment paradigm continues to evolve with the introduction of new therapies. It, it's very important that we make an accurate diagnosis in the beginning, distinguishing it from the precursor stages of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance and smoldering myeloma. Once a diagnosis is made, it's important for us to risk stratify these patients and before starting them on their initial therapy. Now, the initial treatment uh, you typically consists of an induction phase, um, which is followed by an autologous stem cell transplant as consolidation in those patients who are eligible to undergo the procedure, followed by maintenance therapy. Unfortunately, the majority of the patients continue to relapse with multiple myeloma, and we have to uh, develop new therapeutic regimens in order to continue to maintain the uh, disease control over a period of time. To start off, I wanted to spend a um, minute or so on the um, precursor condition of small tree multiple myeloma. The small tree myeloma is a transition stage between monoclonal myopathy of undetermined significance and active myeloma. And we have developed scoring systems in order to identify those patients at the highest risk of progression from small tree myeloma to active myeloma. And using the International Myeloma Working Group 20 to 20 criteria and the cytogenetics, we can identify a group of patients who are at extremely high risk of progression to myeloma, uh, in fact, close to uh, 60 to 70 percent risk in the first two years, compared to um, a, some patients who are at relatively low risk of less than 20 percent uh, over a prolonged period of time. Now, there have been phase three trials that have looked at the outcomes of patients with high risk multi myeloma, demonstrating that there is actually an improvement uh, in overall survival and progression free survival with treatment with lenalidomide and dexamethasone in these high risk patients. Subsequent phase two trials like this uh, ECOG trial showed that using uh, lenalidomide as a single agent uh, as early therapy and given for a limited period of time uh, can improve the uh, progression free survival in patients with high risk moldering myeloma. As a result of these trials, nowadays, if someone has high risk moldering multiple myeloma by the IMWG criteria, we would recommend starting them on therapy with at least lenalidomide or even better consider enrolling them in an ongoing clinical trial. Now, a couple of uh, slides on the diagnosis and risk stratification, as I men mentioned before, it is very important that we distinguish between patients who have active multiple myeloma and those with precursor phases like Marcus or small ring myeloma. Now, the classically, the definition of symptomatic multiple myeloma was based on the presence of the CRAB features the hypercalcemia, renal insufficiency, anemia, and bone disease. And more recently, we have introduced uh, three other characteristics with a bone marrow plasma cell percentage of at least 60%, um, more than one PET or MRI-based lesions, which are not lytic, and a free light chain ratio that is more than 100, all three of which predict a 80% risk of progression in two years. Now, when you use the free light chain criteria of more than 100 ratio, one need to be careful uh, that we only include those patients who also have significant amount of light chain secretion in the urine. If they are not excreting any light chain in the urine, the free light chain ratio may be unreliable uh, in order to make a diagnosis. Now, from a risk stratification standpoint, the most important uh, characteristics include the cytogenetic abnormalities. In addition to the uh, historically non uh, high-risk translocations. Um, more recent studies suggest that abnormalities of chromosome 1, both chromosome 1 Q gain and um, amplification, also appear to increase the risk of progression and survival in patients with multiple myeloma. There have been studies like this which have shown different treatments can have differential impact on these, um, and we will talk about that in a second. But one thing that we have learned over the years is that there are multiple different risk factors, each of which independently contributes to risk stratification. So more recently, we developed a um, staging system that adds up uh, all these different high-risk characteristics, including presence of high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities like 17p deletion, 1q abnormality or IGH translocation, as well as an ISS stage 3 or elevated LDH. 
By using these five characteristics, we are able to create three groups with very different outcomes, uh, which appears to perform better than the traditional ISS or the RIS staging system. Now, switching gears and talking about the treatment of newly diagnosed myeloma, as I indicated before, the initial therapy of multiple myeloma is very important. And the goal of the initial therapy is to bring the disease under rapid control and reverse some of the um, side effects or uh, impact uh, symptoms related to the multiple myeloma and also uh, with minimal manageable toxicity. Now, the combination of bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor, lenalidomide, which is an immunomodulatory drug, and dexamethasone has been studied in phase three trials like the SWOG trial that showed that adding bortezomib to lenalidomide and dexamethasone improved not only the progression-free survival, but also the overall survival. So the combination of VRD has become a standard injection therapy prior to taking patients to an autologous stem cell transplant. Recently, we did a large phase three trial that tried to improve upon VRD by replacing the bortezomib with carfilzomib, which is a second generation proteasome inhibitor. And we found that there was no improvement in the PFS by replacing bortezomib with carfilzomib. Um, with some of the increased depth of response that we saw with carfilzomib was neutralized by the increased cardiac and pulmonary toxicity that we saw with this drug. So the bortezomib lenalidomide still continues to be uh, a standard initial treatment for these patients. Now, the Griffin trial, on the other hand, looked at trying to add daratumumab, an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, to the VRD combination both before a transplant and after a transplant as consolidation, followed by maintenance with either both the drugs or one of the drugs. So Dara Len versus Len. Now this trial showed that adding the daratumumab both as part of injection therapy, consolidation and maintenance, not only improved the depth of response, but these patients continue to have deepening responses over time. As you can see on the left-hand side in purple compared to the orange on the right-hand side with out uh, And not only did the uh, overall response rate improve with the addition of teratimumab, it also led to um, higher rates of minimal residual disease negativity, which we know typically in the past have translated to better uh, survival outcomes. And so far with the updated data, we feel uh, the progression-free survival has just started showing some improvement uh, with the addition of teratimumab, while the overall survival still remains um, uh, comparable. Based on the data so far, I think it's important for us to wait for larger phase three trials to read out before uniformly accepting the four drug regimen uh, with the limited data. Now, once we do the injection therapy, the next question that comes up is whether we can um, subject the patient to an autologous stem cell transplant and whether it has any benefit. Now, the IFM 2009 trial was a phase three trial that randomized patients to either an early autologous stem cell transplantation after injection followed by consolidation versus uh, transplant potentially at the time of relapse and showed that there was a significantly better progression-free survival with the early transplant approach. Now, this result was recently confirmed also by another phase two, phase three trial called the determination trial. However, the transplant trials so far have not shown any improvement in overall survival which uh, should not detract from the use of an autologous stem cell transplant because we know from previously that if you salvage those patients who did not get transplanted in the upfront setting by using them at the time of relapse, these patients can have good overall survival outcomes. Now, the, another trial that looked at the role of autologous stem cell transplant was the FORTE trial that randomized patients to getting either KRD, carfilzomib, eneldomide, dexamethasone, or carfilzomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone as injection therapy, and also randomizing patients to getting transplant or not transplant. And the trial uniformly showed that patients who got KRD injection transplant KRD uh, consolidation um, had a better progression-free survival, irrespective of whether they're standard risk or high-risk disease. And post-transplant, the current standard of care is to use lenalidomide maintenance uh, for patients uh, with myeloma. And this is based on several phase three trials, including this meta-analysis of these trials, which demonstrated an improved overall survival for the use of lenalidomide maintenance. However, the high-risk patients don't appear to benefit as much with lenalidomide, and hence they have been uh, interest in looking at 
two drug maintenance as was done in the Forte trial. And this, in this trial, we saw that patients who received a carfilzomib and aneldomate maintenance had better PFS compared to aneldomate alone, particularly in the patients with high-risk disease. Now, more recently, there have been a phase three trial called the Cassiopeia trial that looked at direct movement maintenance after a quadruplet induction and arterial stem cell transplant. This trial showed a um, progression-free survival benefit for direct movement maintenance. However, the benefit um, was seen um, both in patients who had um, previous uh, direct movement as part of induction therapy and then did not get maintenance after transplant as well as the people who got it before and after. So again, raising the question as the appropriate timing of using direct movement in the setting of newly diagnosed myeloma. So in our own practice, our standard of care of approach is for standard risk patients to use BRD injection, collect stem cells after four cycles, and then potentially uh, take them to an autologous stem cell transplant. And if they don't get a transplant, continue with BRD and then LEN maintenance. In patients with high-risk disease, we use a four-drug induction therapy with uh, one or two transplants followed by a two-drug um, maintenance. What about patients who cannot undergo stem cell transplant? And these are over half of the patients with myeloma. In these patients, we can use the um, bortezomib lentex, but use them with a reduced dose and in a 35 um, day cycle instead of a 21 day cycle. By using a less intense VRD, we are able to get comparable responses and comparable progression free survival as one would see with the full dose in younger patients. More recently, a large phase three trial called the Maya trial looked at adding the retinomat lendromite dexamethasone, just as was done in the newly diagnosed world, this was added to bortezomib lentex. And the Maya trial showed that there's not only an improved progression free survival, but also an improved overall survival. Uh, with the three drug combination compared to the two drug combination. As a result, the combination of deratimumab and dexamethasone has become the standard initial therapy for patients who um, are not eligible to go to a stem cell transplant. You can certainly consider RVD light as well in these patients. So in our own practice, we would prefer to use BRD uh, in patients with standard risk patients, in patients with high-risk disease. Um, there's still some debate as to whether DRD would be appropriate or whether we need to do BRD. In the Maya study, high-risk patients had about 44-month PFS compared to the BRD, which was approximately 36 months in the other trials. So I think um, either would be a reasonable at this point in time. Now, what about relapsed myeloma? And unfortunately, the majority of the patients with myeloma will relapse at some point in time, and we have to figure out new therapies for them. And when you think about relapsed disease, we can consider the early relapse, which is the, the first two or three lines of therapy, or late relapse, which can be um, subsequent um, relapses. Now, in general, there are some principles which guide uh, our approach to treatment of relapse disease. One of them is um, the duration of initial response. And patients who get very short duration of response to the initial therapy usually have aggressive disease or poor disease biology and the patients have to be managed accordingly. We would prefer to use at least a three drug combination, preferably a um, two active drug classes, and we want to try and change um, these uh, triplets so that um, we can give patients new drug classes each time we start them on a new therapy. We have to take into account patient characteristics, including the performance status, age, and comorbidities, um, as well as prior toxicities and patient uh, preferences. In general, we want to continue this till maximum response and maintain these patients on at least one drug till progression or until it is no longer tolerated. So when you think about that first one or two or three relapses, we are looking at uh, three drug regimens that will be non-overlapping in terms of the drug class. So if patients are not refracted to lenalidomide at first relapse, we can combine protism inhibitors, elotizumab or deratimumab to lenalidomide dexamethasone. If they are refracted to lenalidomide, we would use combinations of proteasome inhibitors, second generation immunomodulatory drug like pomegranate uh, and anti CD38 monoclonal antibodies. And when the patients relapse the next time, we would change these agents around so that they can be exposed to drugs they have not previously seen. So, what are the options for these um, patients who are the time of relapse? Um, clearly, there are approved drugs, um, and there are also several very exciting immunotherapies that are going through clinical trials. 
and we will go, to, go through uh, some of them in a second. So the selinexor is a nuclear transport protein inhibitor. That's a new drug class in myeloma. The Boston trial is a phase three trial that looked at adding selinexor to bortezomib dexamethasone and showed that the addition improved the median progression-free survival by about four and a half months um, compared to bortezomib dex alone. Now, the another drug that is approved is called belantamab mafodotin. This is an antibody drug conjugate that targets a surface protein called uh, B-cell maturation antigen. And this, uh, in the um, initial studies, have demonstrated um, response rate of about 30% and a progression-free survival of roughly about um, four to five months. But in patients who do get a response, they appear to have responses that last for uh, up to a year. Some of the most exciting um, new developments have been the introduction of the CAR T cells. We have two CAR T products that have been approved for use in relapsed myeloma. One of them is IDASL. This targets the B cell maturation antigen. And as with all CAR T cells, they have an intracellular signaling domain and a co-stimulatory domain. Now, typically what the cells are effereased, uh, patients and potentially undergo bridging chemotherapy, and then the cells are reinfused. In the KAMA trial, we saw that the overall response rate was almost 73% across all the dose levels. And this is in a group of patients who are heavily pretreated and refractory to all the available drugs. The median progression-free survival was about little less than a year, and the median overall survival of about a year and a half, both much better than one would have anticipated um, given the natural history of these patients. The second uh, CAR T cell that's approved is the uh, SILTA cell. Very similar approach. You get uh, collect the T cells, give bridging therapy, give lymphodepletion therapy with flu you reinfuse the cells, and then assess the response. And with the Silta cell, we saw that majority of the patients responded to therapy. Um, in fact, majority of the patients had a very good partial response, and most patients were able to, or a significant number were able to be MRD negative. The median progression free survival is roughly about two years, and the median overall survival has not been reached for this cohort of heavily pretreated patients, so very exciting therapy. Another group of uh, treatments that have been um, quite exciting is the bispecific T-cell engagers. These are bispecific antibodies that bring the T-cells close to the tumor cell, resulting in tumor cell death. There is one called the teclisumab, which we hope will be approved fairly soon, targets BCMA, and in the initial studies have a response rate of almost uh, 60%. Um, one of the major side effects, both with these with the bispecifics and the CAR T, is the cytokine release syndrome, and this can be seen in a significant number of patients, but very easy to manage. Other major major side effects include uh, increased risk of infections in these patients. So um, clearly, there are a lot of things that have changed in the um, overall um, myeloma treatment paradigm, including concepts around the precursor disease of monoclonal antibody and significance. I didn't show the data, but there is no role for routine screening for monoclonal gammopathy. In the newly diagnosed patients, at least a triplet regimen should be considered, but in high-risk patients, four drug regimens can be considered, uh, including anti-CD38 protein inhibitors and immunomodulatory drugs. Daratimumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone should be the standard for the non-transplant eligible patients. Post-transplant, these patients should continue lenalidomide maintenance. In high-risk patients, two drug maintenance should be considered. In patients who are relapsed, again, a sequential use of the available drugs in the form of triplets should be attempted first, and then certainly newer immunotherapies like CAR T and bispecifics can be considered. Eventually, we hope these immunotherapies will move to the early part of the therapy. And there are other drugs like Benetoclax, which is a BCL2 inhibitor, and Ibodamide, a new immunomodulatory drug that are quite effective, but we did not discuss in greater detail, but the clinical trials are ongoing right now. With that, I will stop, and thank you for attention.